Well, good morning, and thank you so much for uh, having me talk about stress incontinence this morning. We're going to frame our discussion uh, using the 2017 AUA SUFU stress incontinence guidelines as a guide for the presentation. And we're going to talk about the current role of your dynamics in the evaluation of the stress incontinent woman, and then talk about the different surgical options, the different types of mid-urethral slings, the bladder neck slings, and the bulking. So the 2017 guidelines, as opposed to their 2010 and 1997 counterparts, uh, had a lot more uh, high-level evidence there uh, on which to frame their recommendations. And so you could obviously tell that randomized control trials uh, will help you get more strong recommendations uh, rather than clinical principles and expert opinions. So when we looked at, at the 2017 guidelines, we saw that the index patient was an otherwise healthy woman that had stress incontinence or stress predominant mixed incontinence that was interested in surgical intervention, and she did not have any previous surgery, and it was okay to have some low-grade pelvic organ prolapse. In the column on the right, you'll see that these are the types of women that were not included, and that includes women with high-grade pelvic prolapse, those with high post-void residuals or voiding dysfunction, obviously neurogenic, lower urinary tract dysfunction, but also some women that we would typically see in our practices, such as those who had recurrent or persistent incontinence after previous surgery, the obese women, and women of advanced age. So obviously, uh, not every woman fit into the index definition. As far as the workup of stress incontinence is concerned, the, uh, it really hasn't changed. For the index patient, essentially, all you need is a positive cough stress test, a urinalysis that shows no hematuria or UTI, and a post-void residual that is low, and you can start discussing surgical intervention with them. The panel did state that uh, typically cystoscopy in an index patient should not be performed unless there's some concern about lower urinary tract dysfunction, and your dynamics may be omitted when stress incontinence is clearly demonstrated. And it had a grade B evidence and a conditional recommendation, but we'll talk about that in a second. And in the column on the right side, you'll see all of those uh, conditions that uh, constituted the non-index patient and where additional evaluation should or may be performed. So let's talk about the role of urodynamics in a woman with stress incontinence. And I like to divide this into two separate categories for physicians. So either you're somebody who uh, is in the all you have is a hammer and everything looks like a nail category, meaning that you do the same sling procedure or offer the same treatment for every woman, at which point uh, you don't have to listen to the next couple minutes of my presentation. But if you're somebody that does have different uh, sling procedures in your armamentarium and you use different hammers for different jobs, then the next uh, couple slides will be of importance to you. And this is important because stress incontinence is a quality of life issue. This is not a life or death issue. And non-operative management is an option. The first surgery is the best surgery for these women. And uh, preoperative counseling is important because different slings and different procedures have different risks and benefits. So uh, it's important um, to at least be aware that your dynamics may change your decision making. So let's look at the evidence for against doing your dynamics in women. Uh, this comes from two main studies. The value study was a U.S. trial that randomized over uh, 600 women uh, to either getting a preoperative urodynamics or an office evaluation. And basically, they found that the success was similar for both groups. And these were essentially index patients. The other trial is a European trial that took 126 women with discordant urodynamic findings, detrusor overactivity, dysfunctional avoiding, flow abnormalities, and then randomized them to either immediate surgery or tailored therapy. And at one year, they had similar subjective improvement. And using these findings, the AUA SUFU guidelines as well as the European guidelines basically came out with statements saying that for the index patient, your dynamics is not all that important or will not change management. Now, what's the evidence for your dynamics? Well, a lot of it has to do with the evidence against these two studies. The index patient is the exception. And depending on what definition you use, um, only 15 to uh, 36% of patients fall into the index definition that 
that means that the majority of patients, including the ones that we mentioned, the mixed incontinence patients where stress and urge are similar, uh, recurrent stress incontinency, elderly, those with concomitant prolapse or dysfunctional avoiding, don't fall into the index category, but fall under the purview of our practices. And it, studies have shown that urodynamic evaluation improves the surgeon confidence in their uh, uh, offering certain procedures. And so, as this next slide is going to show, your dynamics can assist you in optimizing your procedure and in preoperative counseling. So, what does your dynamics add to our evaluation? Well, during the filling phase, the, uh, it can add the evidence of detrusor overactivity and valsalva leak point pressures, and certainly those women with low leak point pressures are what we would call intrinsic sphincter deficiency. During the emptying phase, we can get flow rate, we can get avoiding pattern. Do they avoid bipelvic relaxation, detrusor contraction, or valsalva avoiding? And we can get dysfunctional avoiding as well. So when we look at how your dynamic findings can change management, studies have shown that the finding of detrusor overactivity and intrinsic sphincter deficiency can be associated with surgical failure of certain pr procedures. And you might not want to do a transobturator sling in those women with ISD because they have a higher surgical failure. The majority of the findings uh, would help you counsel patients better. And we know that the finding of both DO and ISD can lead to de novo overactive bladder symptoms after surgery, something the patient may want to know, and may be associated with lower patient satisfaction. If they void with something other than a detrusor contraction, then there's a higher chance of them having a failed initial voiding trial and some uh, element of urinary retention afterwards, and a low maximum flow rate can also be associated with retention. So there are some things in the guidelines that are fairly uh, uh, intuitive. If they have a predominantly urge component, then you probably uh, shouldn't be doing slings or primary option. Um, you should be doing a cystoscopy in all patients at the time of sling surgery, and that includes the, uh, all mid-urethral slings. And then if you have pelvic prolapse that you're fixing at the same time, fix the prolapse first, and then tension your sling after fixing the prolapse. And these are fairly intuitive. So when we look at treatment options, uh, and we'll talk about the mid-urethral slings in just a second, there's a few new things here. If you have a fixed immobile urethra, then transobturator or single incision slings are probably not the best option for this. These are the women that you would do retropubic slings on, pubovaginal slings are bulking. Uh, you can use any procedure that you're comfortable with at the time of prolapse repair. Uh, and women that are diabetics, obese, uh, or geriatric patients also can be treated with uh, any number of different uh, procedures. So let's talk about the mid-urethral slings, which obviously have the highest uh, level of evidence supporting them uh, in the literature. And so the, the mid-urethral slings in the Cochrane Review cited below um, are, are very well characterized. We're looking at 81 randomized control trials comparing retropubic and transobturator slings, which included over 12,000 women. And this in the stress incontinence literature is the most extensively researched surgical treatment. We find a couple of different things. First of all, the cure rates are uh, quite similar. Again, the difference in the cure rates is based on the definition of cure. We know that women with lower leak point pressures or trans sphincter deficiency are, are going to do better with retropubic slings. And the transobturator slings, by sheer nature of them not being placed in the retropubic space, are going to have fewer adverse events. The single incision mini slings are the newest variant on a synthetic sling placement. This is done purely through a uh, vaginal approach. They do not exit the skin at any level uh, and um, should be placed under a greater degree of tension. The cure rates are uh, fairly high, but as the guidelines noted, uh, they, this uh, recommendation receives a, it's a conditional recommendation just because of the shorter follow-up and patients should be told that the follow-up in these slings at this point is significantly lower than it is in the other two types of slings. So when we look at adverse events, as far as the intraoperative events go, uh, bladder puncture is uh, almost, almost exclusively seen in the retropubic slings, but is still quite low. Vaginal angle injuries in that periurethral sulcus are more common in your uh, transobturator or 
single incision mini slings, and the other major uh, catastrophes, uh, so to speak, the uh, urethral injury, major vessel or bowel injury, and high blood loss are quite rare. When we look at post-operative adverse events, the vaginal exposure rate is uh, approximately 7% for all slings. Uh, Small asymptomatic exposures can be left alone, while symptomatic or large exposures can be treated with excision of the exposed segment. Groin pain is almost exclusively seen in the transobturator sling, while voiding dysfunction, uh, although low, is higher in the retropubic sling. De novo overactive bladder symptoms uh, should at least be uh, considered to some degree uh, relating to partial obstruction and may need uh, sling loosening or incision uh, to resolve in the future. The 2017 guidelines also made several comments about mesh, and a lot of this is intuitive. If you have an intraoperative uh, urethral injury, you should not proceed with your mid-urethral mesh sling. And also women who have a concomitant urethral diverticulectomy, urethrovaginal fistula repair, or urethral mesh excision should also uh, not undergo concomitant mid-urethral sling placement. Both of these are clinical principles. In addition, the guidelines strongly suggest uh, not placing a mid-urethral sling in women with poor wound healing, such as those with radiation, significant scarring from previous diverticulectomy or fistula surgery, and poor tissue quality. Uh, they don't make any comment about uh, placing these types of mid-urethral slings at a staged uh, fashion. So where do we stand with mesh in 2020? Um, in April of 2019, the FDA ordered uh, the manufacturers of all transvaginal mesh for prolapse repair to immediately stop selling and distributing their products in the U.S. And this followed a similar decision already uh, done in Europe and Australia. Now, what's important about this is that this applies only tr to transvaginal mesh for pelvic prolapse and does not apply to any of the mid-urethral slings or mesh placed abdominally for sacrocopal pexy repair. And since that time, uh, the AUA, SUFU, and other uh, gynecologic organizations have gone on record to support uh, the continued use of mid-urethral slings and uh, against the reclassifications of these slings as type 3 um, uh, products, which would need pre-market approval uh, before being placed on the market. So uh, these are the, the pubovaginal slings are kind of like your old school slings. These are the ones that were placed at the bladder neck rather than mid-urethra. Uh, they're placed through a combined abdominal and vaginal approach and are tied above the rectus fascia. They're very good for intrinsic sphincter deficiency because they do have a slightly greater degree of tightness on them and also are effective for urethral hypermobility. They're great for women uh, who are at high risk for mesh exposure and reoperative patients. And the two main materials we have at this point are autologous materials, rectus fascia, which is obtained through the same abdominal incision, or fascia lata, which is obtained through a separate incision in the leg. And as you can see, the, one, the other options there are ones that have been used in the past for these slings uh, and uh, are commonly not available anymore except some of the uh, uh, allograft uh, materials. When we look at the outcomes, the outcomes are uh, quite good. Uh, again, depending on the definition used, uh, the pubovaginal slings and mid-urethral slings have been compared uh, in 12 randomized trials and there's no difference in patient-reported incontinence between the two procedures. As far as adverse events go, as you would imagine, abdominal wound complications uh, do happen in about a quarter of the patients, and the bladder neck slings are associated with more uh, changes in the voiding pattern, as well as some uh, higher uh, incidence of de novo uh, overactive bladder symptoms afterwards, and the revision approaches 7%. Bulking agents are also available, and these are injected with a cystoscope uh, submucosally in the area of the mid-urethra. Uh, this can be done in the office with a, a shot of uh, uh, lidocaine uh, and with an awake patient. It's the least invasive surgical treatment for stress incontinence uh, and is uh, best suited for women with low leak point pressures or intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Um, there have been um, multiple uh, products uh, available in the past, many of which due to uh, uh, exposure uh, or abscess formation are no longer available. 
Uh, bovine collagen was our standard for many years, but it's not currently uh, commercially available. Uh, the three in the middle are the ones that uh, are most commonly used, and the FDA approved Bulkamid, which is polyacrylamide gel, uh, earlier this year. Uh, as far as outcomes go, they're all over the place, but typically I would say that uh, uh, maybe a third of the women have a significant improvement or a short-term cure. These results are significantly lower than what we see in women with any type of sling procedure, and long-term cure is uncommon. Uh, and uh, I tell all my patients that additional injections may be necessary, but if they fail to improve after three injections, uh, then it's probably not the treatment for them. Adverse events wise, they're uh, typically short term and transient, including some transient elevated residuals or hematuria uh, and not a lot of uh, side effects for these uh, women, but again, also not a long term cure. So when we look at the information uh, we've just discussed, uh, I would uh, tell you that your dynamics should be considered in your non-index patient uh, if it will change your management of the patient uh, or counseling of the patient. Um, retropubic and transoptrator slings have a similar efficacy at this point, but different uh, adverse event profiles. Uh, possibly more dysfunctional voiding or retention for the retropubic slings, and more uh, groin pain and vaginal angle injuries for the transobturator slings. Data for the single incision mini slings is emerging, and keeping in mind that right now they're short term uh, outcomes, and uh, these do need to be tightened uh, a little bit more during their tensioning. Autologous sling is a nice procedure to have in your arsenal, especially for those high risk women. Uh, mesh slings are FDA supported at this point, um, and uh, uh, we hope that they will continue to be so. And then bulking is a, also a useful adjunct to have in, uh, in the office, um, but the long-term results at this point are suboptimal. 